Day. <laughs> What's the same old thing? <laughs> On a certain day, a man went to the dentist. <laughs> He walked in and went to the doctor and said, I am a moth. So the dentist looked at him and said, See, what you need is a psychiatrist, not a dentist. Moth has never any dental problems. You need a psychiatrist. The man said, I know it. Then he said, Why are you here? He said, Because the lights are on. light is on, the moths will come. <laughs> That's why you're here. So, next thing is what am I supposed to do? Nothing. What does a moth do? just drawn by the light rushes into it and kills itself. That's what you're supposed to do. If uh, you're drawn to this and if you're thinking from the satsang, what is the takeaway? No, this is not a fast food restaurant. There is no take, take away. So I have to do the take away, not you. <laughs> I take away. You don't take away anything. <laughs> Nothing to take away. This is give away. If you give away yourself, then there is something. See this take away, give away, everything makes sense only when you're dealing with limited quantities of things. If you're handling only objects in your life, if your life is an objective process <laughs> and if your life is limited, to physical objects, giveaways, takeaways, all these things are meaningful. If your life has been touched by something that is not of the physical nature, then there is no giveaway, takeaway. If you give away everything that is physicality, then there is something that you can't take away, it takes you away. Oh, is this self-destruction? Is this some kind of a negative process? <clears throat> For someone, who is working in the wrong direction, for someone who is taking the whole life process, in a wrong direction, who is having a wrong perspective of life, who is looking at life through a small keyhole. For him, opening the door is going to be a dangerous process. But one who is longing to be free, for him opening the door is a benediction. If I open the door, 
Will there be too many dangers? Yes, there will be. But I want you to know, if you close the door, maybe your neighbor cannot enter your house, maybe your friend cannot enter your house, but death still will through the keyhole. Even if you plug the keyhole, it still does. Actually, it comes quicker. Doors are closed. <laughs> Try and see. Just close these two doors and see. It comes very quick. <laughs> With doors closed, death comes sooner, not later. If one does not know, if one has not known even a moment of abandon in his life, that all your life you have been your own security guard. <laughs> if you are the watchman of the house, not the lord of the house, then an open door is a dangerous thing. A locked door is always the best thing. But if you are the lord of the house, you wish to walk in and out as you feel. Only then you can claim to be the lord of the house. Right now, this… this body, I have no, nothing against the body. I am not against the body. But I am not for the body is either. Because what the body contains is very important, keeping the body well becomes important. Because what the body embodies is sacred, keeping the container in a certain level of sanctity becomes important. Let me see, all of you, just come out of your body for some time and then get back. Can you? Just come out for a while, two minutes and get back. Can you? No. Even if you are staying in a palace, if you cannot come out, that's called a prison. That's not called a palace. Yes? See, I'm not asking that question yes or no anymore. <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> Even if you're living in a palace, if you cannot walk out and walk in by your choice, you cannot call it a palace, it's only a prison. If you cannot come out of this, by choice and get back by choice, definitely it's a trap and a prison. If you're not willing to open the doors because you're security conscious, it's safe. In search of safety, all kinds of idiotic things have been done, very life negative things very self-destructive things. Now if I talk about the rivers, it looks like I am talking negative. Once a little boy went up to his mother and said, Mama, I want to go and swim in the river. The mother said, No way, you are not going to get into that river. That river is full of alligators hungry, bloodthirsty alligators, crocodiles. Don't you ever step into that river. But mama, every day in the morning, daddy swims in that river. Oh, don't you worry about him, he has an excellent insurance cover. An insurance is not a safety for your life, it's good for somebody. It's very good for somebody who is wishing you to die. <laughs> it's 
just uh, for some exigencies that may happen, insurance, but it is not a safety. A closed door is not a safety. To handle certain situations, we close the door, open the door. But a door is a door only if it can close and open. If it is always closed, it's a wall, isn't it? A door is a door only if you can open and close by choice. If it's shut all the time, it is not a door. You cannot call it a door. So, uh, why am I here? What am I doing? Then the next question will be, Sadhguru, what, what is it that you're trying to tell us anyway? <laughs> I'm sure it's going to progress. There's only one thing I'm trying to tell you. I'm just trying to beat my own drum, but these boys are keeping all of them, but to blow my own trumpet that I know, I know and I know, that's all I'm trying to say. I know, not only that I know, that which you want to know is also me. That which can know is also me. This is the self trumpet that I'm blowing all the time. Don't believe all the other words. All I'm trying to say is I know, I know, I know, I know. This is somebody blowing his own trumpet all the time. Day in and day out, every opportunity whether people are willing or not willing, whether the situation is appropriate or not appropriate, same thing. That sounds hedonistic. It is. If there is no thirst in your heart, it is a horrible thing, somebody going on saying he knows. If there is a thirst in your heart, to hear this that somebody can clearly say that he knows is the greatest benediction if there is thirst in your heart. Hmm? Water is valuable only when you're thirsty, isn't it? If you're thirsty, a glass of water is divine. Otherwise, what is it? Doesn't mean anything. Only when you're thirsty. Packed up like this, I believe you're thirsty. <laughs> I hope I can assume that. Sadhguru, what is the exact nature of the relationship between any guru and his disciple? Is the guru an authoritarian, a parent, a friend? This is the corniest question you can ask. <laughs> friend, I'm willing to be, but I'm not actually. If I be your friend, it's good for me but not at all good for you. Because a friend means what? Somebody who supports you in your limitations. Somebody who makes you feel comfortable. Somebody who sustains your ego. Would you make friendship with somebody who punctures your ego? You will not. Somebody who shores up your ego, somebody who betrays your ego, that is the one whom you would choose as a friend. So friend, definitely not. That you must know by now. <laughs> Parent, I have great regard and reverence for mine and yours, but <laughs> But parenthood happened out of certain ignorance, 
out of certain compulsions. Most people didn't know what they were doing. You were ten, twelve years of age, you were just fine. You became fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Your very inert got… inerts got poisoned with other kinds of chemicals. Suddenly you looked at this woman, all kinds of things happened. You looked at this man, all kinds of things happened. <laughs> they were quite okay, just last year. But now suddenly you look, suddenly everything looks somehow. Somehow from within you got poisoned in such a way that everything started looking in a certain way. You will see once this hormonal hijack is over, you look at everybody, everybody looks normal. <laughs> you look at a man or a woman, they look just normal. When this was on, you looked at them, they looked like fire. <laughs> it consumed you, it was not unreal, it was real. It was very real, isn't it? So, parents or merchantly people who are trying to do all the things that they could not do in their own lives through their children, normally, not always. Some of them are here, so you know, we keep uh, seeing this. Uh, our school teachers kept coming to me, people who are running the school come and tell me, you know, we made it very clear to the parents, once you put your child into Isha home school, we are not going to give you a marks card. We are not going to put up a marks card and say your child is better than somebody else's child. Everything is being done, a great amount of striving to see that the child flowers. Many things, very elaborate things are being done which very few schools in the world can ever do. <laughs> but uh, slowly, you know, they're okay, they know it's nice, children are developing well, they're physically, mentally, they seem to be much more mature than themselves which is very threatening. But <laughs> All that is fine, but when they go back for the vacation, the neighboring, the neighbor's children, they say, we got ninety-two. What is your number? Our kids don't know what number <laughs> they belong to. They… what number? We don't have numbers <laughs> So parents feel very diffident, my child doesn't have a better number. So they come back and they get worked up and they come and say, no, no, this is should happen, my child is not doing as well as he could. If my child goes to some other school, he would get hundred out of hundred. Then I… I told them, next time somebody raises this, just tell the parents, first bring their marks cards. <laughs> All the parents should bring their mark sheets, let's see how much they got. We'll say it's just genetic <laughs> If your child got twenty-three instead of ninety-two, it's genetic problem, you know So, one or two parents, once you ask this question, the rumor spreads on, they're going to ask for your marks card, don't don't ever ask <laughs> about your children <laughs> So parent, definitely not. Authoritarian? I think I fit into that. An authoritarian means… Uh, usually you think authoritarian means 
a Hitler, a Stalin or a Mussolini or somebody else like that. No, they really had no control over anything. All the time things were freaking around them. They were trying to keep control in the most violent ways but they never had control over anything. Yes, things were always falling apart around them. But uh, I think I fit into that label much better than them because uh, when it comes to life, it doesn't matter what you say, what you think, what you do, what I say will happen when it comes to life, fundamental life. So I am an authoritarian because I don't listen to anybody. With simple things of life, even if a child speaks, I will listen with great respect. But when it comes to certain aspects of life, it doesn't matter who, if God comes, I will not listen to him because I know better than him. This sounds absolutely egoistic, stupid, Mike Tyson-like. <laughs> but what can I do? It's true. So when it comes to life, fundamental life, I am an absolute authoritarian. There's no question. There are no two ways about it. You quote the scripture to me, I will dismiss it. You bring your pandit to me, I will dismiss him. You bring anybody to me, you wake Buddha up from his grave and bring him, I'll still dismiss him unless he agrees with me. So I am a total authoritarian when it comes to life. I think I fit into that label better than anything else. Is that okay with you? Please, anybody want to ask questions here? Hmm? Uh, do pyramids have any spiritual significance? Pyramids. You are neither a pharaoh nor are you dead. So, nobody is going to build a pyramid for you. Do pyramids have any significance? These Egyptians, over 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, they started building this. Pyramids is what you have heard about mainly because it is always the Westerners who write books. Generally the Eastern people, they see something, if it overwhelms them, they just shut up, they don't say anything. But it's a Western mind. The moment they see something, they have to write a book on it. There are pluses and minuses to this. Lots of minuses but lots of pluses, otherwise you wouldn't have heard about the pyramids unless you went there. Because it's the western minds which generally talked about it, they only talked about the pyramids of Egypt because they are very death oriented. It is because of this, the obsession with pleasure. Death and pleasure are very directly connected. People always think life and pleasure are connected, no. Death and pleasure are very directly connected. If you are very alive, if you become alive fully. I know the Eastern minds have also absorbed this in a horribly mm, distorted way. But right now if you told your friend or your relative, I'm going to the ashram for three days, they would become very kind towards you and ask, why, what went wrong? <laughs> Something must be wrong with your life. You're going to the ashram to heal a wound, to solace yourself. Something must be really wrong with your life or you must be too old for life. Otherwise, why would you go to an ashram? 
So this has crept into this culture also. Essentially, if you are alive only in parts or if you are partially alive, to be partially alive, to be partially alive is a terrible torture. Many of you have been through these science classes, I'm sure you opened up frogs and cockroaches, did you? They were nice lively beings, but you opened them up because you wanted to find their heart and liver and kidney. Half alive, being half alive is torture. Have you seen this? Always being half alive is torture. This is the torture that a large segment of humanity is going through right now because they are half alive. Only one part of them has become alive. Only their physicality and mentality has become alive. The rest of it is yet to become alive. Half alive people will suffer everything. They will suffer ignorance, they will suffer education, they will suffer poverty, they will suffer affluence, they will suffer being alone, they will suffer being in a relationship. If they are not married, they suffer. If they're married, they married, they… If they don't have children, they suffer that. As if children, if they are there, they can come and bite you. They do. No children, what are you suffering? But that also they suffer. Just show me one thing that human beings are not suffering right now. Just show me one aspect of life that human beings are not suffering right now. They're suffering just about anything, not just life. They're even suffering death before it happens. See, he's thinking of a building a pyramid for himself. <laughs> That which is and that which is not, everything they suffer. This is not… You are not suffering loneliness, you are not suffering company, you are not suffering money, you are not suffering poverty. What you are suffering is you are half alive. You are desperately trying to make yourself fully alive through money, through drink, through sex, through going on a trek, coming to the ashram. <laughs> In so many ways, you are somehow trying to make yourself fully alive, which is yet to happen fully. Here and there you feel a burst of aliveness, but again it ebbs down. So when people are constantly half alive, pleasure becomes an important part of your life, very important part of your life. Without it, you cannot exist. Pleasure becomes paramount in your life when you're only half alive, when physicality is all that you know. Pleasure becomes of immense importance in your life. If you become fully alive, you will become so blissful, joyful, ecstatic without reason bursts of ecstasy within you without any reason. It's almost embarrassing. <laughs> now, the thought of pleasure just evaporates. Looking for a drink, looking for some kind of pleasurable thing just evaporates out of your mind because you're fully alive. When you're fully alive, pleasure disappears. When you're half dead, pleasure is an important, important thing. When half of you is buried in the grave, to have pleasure becomes extremely important. Graves have their own problems, you know. Some time ago I told you there is no problem in the grave, but graves have their own problems because after I went into these pyramids and saw 
just recently, you know. I went into these Egyptian pyramids and saw graves have their own heavy problems. Mrs. Peabody, okay with the name? Mrs. Peabody was a hypochondriac, all the time worried about that something, some ailment is catching up with her. So she bothered her physician so badly, all the time, every day she comes up with a new complaint. And the doctor knew She's making it up all the time because there is no other way. If nobody pays attention, if nobody touches you and sees every day, you think you're going to die. So the doctor just started giving her aspirin under different names. You know there are many companies. Every day a new prescription, same aspirin, new prescription. And she would feel better tomorrow she comes up with a new problem. One day she came and said, I have chest pain. Doctor gave her aspirin. That evening she died. This was real. <laughs> the doctor felt very bad. He just assumed that she is still making it up. Three days later, the doctor died. Not because of this, he just died. Everybody dies, you know. A day this way or that way. And it so happened, they found him a plot, a grave plot, right next to Mrs. Peabody's and he was buried. And there he heard a knock on his coffin. He said, who's that? I said, why doctor? It is me, Mrs. Peabody. Do you have something for worms? This is real. <laughs> so, just to dodge the worms, the trouble that the Egyptians took is unbelievable. You know, you heard of the mummies? They took the liver out and put it in a can of something. They took the heart out and put it in another part. They put different parts of the body and then they wrapped this up and wrapped this up in so many different ways, an elaborate process. And then this building, there are over three million stones, each one of them weighing over twenty to twenty-five tons in the… one of the largest pyramids that are there. And it's a fabulous engineering feat, no question about it. Fabulous, fabulous engineering feat. We have to marvel at their engineering skills. But about their knowledge about afterlife, <laughs> there's nothing much to say. <laughs> but the most important thing in Egypt is not the pyramids. It is the fabulous temples that they built. They built some of the most magnificent temples on this planet, the largest and the most magnificent. You won't see anything like that in India. Most of them were built for sun god and certain goddesses. The sun god in Egypt is referred to as Ra. What do you call sun? There are many names, you know, Ravi, Ravi. And today, most of the world's history was written by the English, the British. Generally, either history was written by the conquering generals or by the conquering priests. Both of them are vested interests. There's a whole parallel line of history written by the French, French historians, 
wrote history, which is barely read in the world. All our textbooks, the Indian textbooks, are one hundred percent by the British authors. So these people write a certain kind of history, which is the history of the generals and the priests. But the Egyptian culture is all about temples, huge. Somebody worships a pyramid, which is a place of death. So they are very death-oriented. So when they saw the temples full of life, music, dance, revelry, life, they didn't like it. It looked most irreligious to them. They wanted to pull down the temples, but these were too massive, massive, massive. Massive means you would not imagine buildings like that. I would like a meditation hall like that, but the Egyptian temples are truly massive, truly massive. The Karnak temple, which is one of the well-preserved lot, which is over 4,600 years old, is something like I may not be exact on this, I would say it is something like uh, twenty times the Rameshwaram temple that we have, which is one of the largest temples we have. That's how large it is. And in terms of its height, it is running into, you know, really fabulous heights. Above all, what kind of devotion must have driven this people? four millenniums ago to handle rocks like this. Some of these pylons which they have made, which have made them stand up, which have been transported hundreds of kilometers down the river Nile and erected. They are stones which weigh over four hundred to five hundred tons, running to twenty-seven meters tall. What kind of devotion must have driven these people? to do this kind of work. No machines, no trucks, no cranes, just human beings. It takes phenomenal sense of devotion and sense of purpose for anybody to do this. And today French historians are writing that Egyptian culture was connected with the Vedic culture seven thousand years ago and the builders went from here, from this land. This you can see in Baalbek temple in Lebanon, which is once again about 4,200 years old. But once again it's a fabulous, fabulous feat. They don't have any granite in the area. So they brought it from Egypt, they transported it across what is now Suez Canal and they brought it up through Syria and climbed up the mountains, which is over 350 to 360 kilometers of climb on the mountain, and they put it up there, a huge temple, a Phoenician temple which was built almost 4,200 years ago. And here you will see lotuses hanging from the ceiling. A lotus in Lebanon, there is no such possibility because these are Indian sculptors. So there is history in Lebanon which clearly says Indian elephants, Indian labor and Indian sculptors came and worked here. And the most amazing thing for me was, I saw a sixteen-pointed stone even today when we do the Guru Puja, Guru Puja is essentially in the yogic parlance, it is known as Shoda Shopachara, that means sixteen ways of treating a guru. That's what Guru Puja is. So usually we have a Guru Puja stone which we still don't have in ashram because of whatever. We're still putting up the stones, the standing ones. The sixteen-pointed Guru Puja stone, which is prepared traditionally in a certain way, is essentially from the yogic culture. It cannot come from anywhere else. You will see 
a proper Guru Puja stone with all the necessary symbols and everything in Lebanon, which is over 4,000 years old. So today, a lot of French historians have published many aspects of history. So pyramids are just one aspect, but they have become very popular because of very death-oriented people. The temples of Egypt should have been celebrated. And the defacement of these temples, who did such a crime? Even a caveman, if he walks into this temple, he cannot help being overwhelmed. The columns are standing twenty-seven meters tall, hundreds of them, not one or two. Even if a caveman without any sense of aesthetics walked into this place, he cannot help being overwhelmed. You don't need, you don't need to be an artist, you don't need to be a connoisseur of art. The crudest human being, if he walks in, he will be overwhelmed by what's been done there. Nobody can miss it. This is the way to build a temple, that nobody can miss it. Temple is not for one specialized sadhaka, that nobody should be able to miss it. That's how overwhelming it should be. And the structure and the ambience of that is as important as the energy of that place, because otherwise people will miss it. They built the right kind of temple as a temple should be built. But these people who defaced the temples, they wrote the history and they talked only about the pyramids. That was fascinating for them. This they wanted to demolish. They would have raised it to ground if they could, but it was too much work, they couldn't do it. Otherwise they would have just finished it. So pyramids are just one foolish, foolish effort towards immortality. We have no such problems in India. We have no longing for immortality. Our whole effort is to end it. <laughs> Our whole effort is to end the cycle of birth and death. Mukti is the attitude, Nirvan is the attitude, Moksha is the attitude. That's the goal. Immortality is not the goal. So, well, I have fabulous things to say about Egyptian engineering, but nothing to say about Egypt's Egyptian knowledge of the beyond. There is nothing much. There is some occult. There is, they created certain things which are beautiful, no question. Not that they were totally ignorant, but the kings are always the most ignorant of the whole population. Always. They are the most egoistic, the crudest, most ruthless. They will become the kings. The gentle, beautiful ones never become kings. Rare is such a human being. Rare is such a culture that once in a way they saw a gentle, beautiful, enlightened king. Otherwise they were always the crudest, grossest, cruelest and the most ruthless who became the kings. So the pyramids were not built for every Egyptian. It was built only for the pharaohs who were the kings who had a stupid belief that they will come back again and occupy the same old broken body. I don't know why such a wish. There are enough women in the world, you can get into their wombs and come back with a brand new body. <laughs> I don't see what is the point preserving the body, keeping your liver in a pot, keeping your heart in a pot. And now tourists are gazing at your heart and liver. People are dying to take a picture with a pharaoh's heart. Pyramid is a powerful form because it's preservative in nature. How to overcome positiveness? Oh, okay, okay. The 
don't try to overcome possessiveness. Just possess something absolutely and see. Once you know the pain of being possessed, trying to possess something, once you know the pain of that, the pain will heal you of possessiveness. <laughs> you trying to overcome possessiveness is not going to work because you've already tried, isn't it? Obviously you've tried, you've failed and that's why you're asking me. <laughs> Possess absolutely. Whether it's your husband or your child or your… even your home or even your dog, try hard to possess it totally. You will see it will bring unbearable pain to you. when it brings that kind of pain, it'll cure you. <laughs> so, uh, why is it that you want to possess? You know, in India or anywhere in the world, if you say somebody is possessed, what it means? The one who is possessed is a victim, but one who possesses, you know who he is? <laughs> you are just that. When you try to possess, you will become a devil. No, 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 I love very much. But yes, with good intentions you will become a devil. That is the problem about possessiveness very good intentions. And how do you know devil has no good intentions for you? Who knows? How do you know God has good intentions for you? Only the… only the propaganda says so, but you don't know for sure, isn't it? Yes. If all this is God's making, all that's happening in your life, you don't really know whether he has good intentions for you or not anymore, isn't it? <laughs> no. You know for sure? You know for sure? You don't know. And you don't know whether devil has bad intentions for you, you don't know. But one who is… one who possesses is usually a devil. So with good intentions. When we said somebody is a devil, we did not question his intention. We only are talking about the result of his action, isn't it? Yes? We are not questioning his intention. We… a devil of a wind. Maybe the wind is blowing with good intention, but because it's devastating your home, you call it the devil because of the result, isn't it? So if the result that you are bringing about is painful, you are the devil. Your intentions may be good, but the result is painful for somebody around you, then you're a devil. So if you manage to possess, you must be a devil. And uh, these victims who are possessed by something else, they can cause hell of a lot of problem to everybody around them. Have you seen them? <laughs> so if I tell you don't possess, you are not going to stop anyway because this is a very deep-rooted problem. This is not going to go away because of somebody's advice. Please don't possess anybody. It's not going to go away. You may shift your objects of possession from this to that, but the longing or the need to possess is not gone. You may shift your object of possessing from this to that because you're wanting to possess something is essentially coming from a certain sense of unfulfilled experience of life, 
a certain sense of being incomplete. All you are trying to do is fulfill yourself, I want you to understand. You are not trying to be rich, you are not trying to be ambitious, you are not trying to be possessive. The answer is same for greed, for anger, for hatred. You are not trying to be all this, all you are trying to do is somehow find fulfillment. Either by embracing this person or by killing this person or by taking what he has or by taking him, somehow you want to fulfill yourself because you are unable to bear the incompleteness of who you are. Try hard, will not get you anywhere. So all I am telling you is, you try everything. You try greed, you try possessiveness, you try love, you try lust, you try what you want. If you realize it's not getting you anywhere, you must be sensible enough to shift. If something is not working and you're going on this, doing the same thing, then you are an idiot beyond redemption, isn't it? Hmm? Uh, don't listen to my advice, try something. If it works, go on that path. If it doesn't work, leave the nonsense and try something else, isn't it? And you will see, none of these things will work. All of them will create a sense of as if it's going to work, but they'll deceive you later. <laughs> try hard and see. Don't try in a lukewarm way. Try absolutely. If you try absolutely within twenty-four hours, you will know. If you try off and on in lukewarm ways, it'll take a lifetime to know. Then if there are twenty-four qualities, you need twenty-four lifetimes to realize this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. If you try really hard, within twenty-four hours you will know it doesn't work. Whatever it is, your problem, go all the way into it. You'll see, within twenty-four hours, this is no good, it will never work, it will be hundred percent clear to you. Once it's clear to you, I trust your intelligence. The only thing that I trust is intelligence. Because life is intelligence. The tree is blossoming, it is a certain intelligence. The very earth that you walk upon is intelligent, the air that you breathe is intelligent. One way of looking at life is, life is just an explosion of intelligence. What you call as creation and what you refer to as the creator is the ultimate intelligence, isn't it? That's the only thing you can trust right now. And that will function only if you go all the way. If you go like this, it will give you a false sense of comfort and solace. You can carry on with these stupid things for a whole lifetime. You know it doesn't work but it's not intense enough. So give yourself absolutely to whatever nonsense you're doing. Very soon, within a day, you will know it doesn't work. It doesn't work. If you realize it doesn't work, I believe you will shift. Am I wrong? Can I believe that you will shift? Something doesn't work and you're sure it doesn't work, you will shift. Fulfillment, completeness is not going to happen by getting this or getting that. It will only happen when this piece of life is alive to its core. That the very source of creation in this you have divined. Only when you have touched that, then you find everything is fine. Now you can play life like a football game. You're on when it's on, when you want to switch it off, it's off then nothing is a problem. Getting that, it will only happen when this piece of life is alive to its core. 
that the very source of creation in this you have divined. Only when you have touched that, then you find everything is fine. Now you can play life like a football game. You're on when it's on, when you want to switch it off, it's off. Then nothing is a problem. Either the body or the mind or the emotion, there cannot be any virtue. Now, for example, he is Virapan, a virtuous man. Reject life. Either we can refer to, refer to this process that you are right now going through as life, or we can refer to this process as death.